We've looked at many pirate radio stations on the channel in the last year, but no pirate is closer to home for me than the legendary Buzz FM, almost certainly Manchester's biggest and most successful pirate. I started researching Buzz FM last year, but there's not a great deal to be found online, so I needed to get on the inside. There are quite a few Buzz FM documentaries on YouTube that were put together by the station many years ago, more specifically by Snowman, a DJ from the station who even appeared alongside Eric B, the station manager, in television documentaries. So I reached out to him, and not only have we worked together to bring you the definitive history of Buzz FM, we'll be taking you on a tour of the city of Manchester, back to where it all began, to where the Ofcom raids happened, to the locations of various studio and transmitter sites, and the final resting place of Buzz FM. After running stations for other people, Buzz's station manager Eric B wanted to provide a radio station for the people of Manchester where the music could be played without restriction and his team of DJs could express themselves as individuals. This was something the Buzz family had always been proud of, with each DJ putting his or her own touch on the show, making the station sound fresh every time you tuned in. Buzz first started broadcasting Asian music in the early 1990s, as many other pirate stations in Manchester were already playing music of black origin. As these stations closed one by one over the years, Buzz evolved in the mid-1990s into the station it became known for, playing soul, swing, R&B, hip-hop, jungle, drum and bass, reggae, dance, garage and ragga. Along with new music, Buzz always kept alive the sounds of the old school, playing classics from the 1970s, 80s and 90s. Buzz FM was, unlike many pirates, a non-profit organisation. They ran adverts on the odd occasion to generate funds which were used to replace things like turntable styluses, broken microphones and other equipment. Any money that was made was no more than £10 per day, just to keep the station running. What's quite remarkable is that Eric never charged DJs subs to play on the station. Buzz supplied the people of Manchester with quality music from the UK and the rest of the world. Whether it was from established recording artists or unsigned artists, Buzz tried to lead the way when it came to playing brand new music. The station took its name from the mentality of Eric, who wanted everyone listening to have a buzz. The station was effectively known as Buzz 88 FM, as 88FM was the original frequency it used until moving to 88.1FM in 2001. At its peak in the late 1990s and early 2000s, Buzz FM was operating 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, with a team of nearly 40 DJs, MCs and artists, mostly from Manchester. The station was so popular that DJs were travelling in from as far afield as the Midlands and London. In 2001 the station became worldwide with the introduction of the Buzz FM website where the signal was broadcast live over the internet as well as on FM with listeners now tuning in from all over the world. Some of the DJs from Buzz were invited to attend interviews at the BBC in Manchester as Radio 1 was about to launch its flagship sister station One Extra, a digital station based in London which in their words would see an end to pirate radio stations. However, because the signal was only available on DAB, pirate stations around at this time continued to dominate the airwaves in the UK. Over the years, the station promoted many new and existing artists from the UK and the US, with many giving up their own free time to visit the station's studios in Manchester to play live as DJs and performers and to take part in interviews. There was also Buzz Nights Out, where the station went on the road to various clubs and venues in the northwest of the UK to play live. The success of Buzz FM was helped by many DJs, performers and MCs. Manchester artists included Sylvia Teller and Cleopatra. Other UK artists included Ed Case, Sweetie Irie, Jamelia and Lamar, as well as international artists such as Wyclef Sean, Buster Rhymes, Exhibit, Missy Elliott and Destiny's Child, who all provided jingles or interviews when they visited the UK. In 2002, Buzz FM was voted one of the six best underground stations in the UK, a massive achievement considering London alone had over 40 pirate stations on the air at this time. 
individual DJs were also recognised with awards at a Manchester venue in February of 2002. Many DJs from Buzz FM also came to the attention of legal radio stations around Manchester and were asked to provide their services on these stations as and when needed. Buzz also raised thousands of pounds for local and UK-based charities over the years, most noticeably BBC Children in Need and various local community organisations such as Pendlebury Children's Hospital and Francis House Trust. They also helped out with Manchester Carnival over the years, providing trucks to enter the procession. Buzz continued the legacy of many Manchester pirates who disappeared, but paved the way in the supply and demand of quality music, long before the legal channels of broadcasting even noticed. Many Manchester stations such as, and get ready for a long list, KFM, Laser FM, Frontline Reggae, Frontline Soul, Sting FM, Love Energy, ICR, ITEL FM, North Soul, IBC, Fresh FM, Soul Nation, Urban Soul, Fat FM, Urban FM, The Pirate Unity FM, 106 FM and Southside Radio and many more disappeared before Buzz FM did. The only other station that managed to continue, albeit less often nowadays, was Irie FM. But for now, let's go back in time and look at the home of Buzz FM and, funnily enough, Eric B's former home. This house in Old Trafford was the hub for all things Buzz FM for most of its life. 1999 saw the construction of the first shed in the backyard of the premises. This was only meant to be a temporary structure, but it lasted for five years. The setup changed over time, but for the most part it consisted of something along the lines of a mixer, two decks, two CD players and a set of monitors. The setup changed due to equipment failure and more often than not, DTI raids. The main 200 watt transmitter at this time was at Hornchurch Court, a tower block in Hume. The signal from the studio to the main transmitter was sent over a 5 watt band 2 link in the house. The link aerial was on the roof, but not on Eric's roof. The this link aerial used to be on this, on this, um, this chimney pot here. We would sometimes also go all the way along the roof here and we would put the link aerial on the very last house. Right. And run so you'd have to climb across there without getting caught? All the way across the top of the roof there. All the way to the other side. This is where the shed stood. The extension wasn't here. And there used to be a tree inside the garden here. This is history. This, this back room here is the studio as well. This was also the studio in the back room at the top here. And then we had the studio at the front of the house as well, in the downstairs room. Right. See that dark patch there, just coming from that window? Oh that yeah. Dark patch, that, that's where the cables used to run down. There was right. about six or seven, everything used to run from that top room there and run down. One evening, police looking for a domestic dispute they'd been called to wandered into the shed, completely by mistake, and were amazed by the studio setup. They had a look round and asked for a shout out on the air and to the surprise of the crew on the air that night, there was never any follow-up by the police. The first shed leaked water and was no longer usable by 2004, so it was demolished. The studio temporarily moved into the house, and the station operated there as well as other locations in between the demolition of the first shed and the construction of a second shed. The new shed was started in around 2008, and was set up in a similar way to the original building, it was rigid, had a strong door, and kept water and weather out. One event in 2004 where two men were spotted in the alleyway behind the house led to suspicions that Ofcom were warning of a potential strike. We heard some scuffling, and we came out and had a look, and we saw a couple of guys in green jackets walk away. The next thing, five minutes later, we get a call in the studio claiming to be from the DTI, right. saying that they were outside the studio, they named where it was, they said they could hear music playing, they told us on this occasion to switch off, otherwise they'd come back within an hour or so. We switched off, we went into the house, we phoned Newton the Willows where Ofcom were based, asked for the guy who'd left his name and was told that he was out of the office on a visit to Manchester today. We believed that they were outside the shed at one point, listening, just weighing things up, but didn't obviously have a warrant on them, so they couldn't come in technically. But yeah, we got a phone call in the studio, which was very strange, you'd never get that, you know, somebody phoned up, official sounding, gave the mm. name of a DTI office. 
and then we phoned them and they said he was in he was in Manchester so the shed remained here until the property was sold in the early 2010s and it was unfortunately demolished without any trace. Hornchurch Court was one of the many favoured transmitter sites over the years, but the loss of rigs at the hands of caretakers and repeated raids by the DTI meant that it wasn't long before it was abandoned. Initially, there was a timer set up to power the transmitter from 4pm to 3am the following morning. The DTI soon realised there was a timer in place and used it to their advantage, so a new way of operating from Hornchurch Court was required. What we would have to do, or how it eventually became, was the station manager would have to come in the morning and take the transmitting equipment down from the previous night. So he'd leave the aerials, but he'd bring the transmitter down, he'd put it in his car and he would take it to work with him. <coughs> and then the evening, on his way back, and the shows would start at say, 4 o'clock in the evening, he'd get here for about half past 3, quarter to 4, and go back up the roof put the transmitter back in and do the same again the next day and the next day and the next day. Is that just in case it got raided? Just in case, because it was the time when it was up here and it just, the boxes were going missing left, right and centre and we weren't sure if it was DTI, weren't sure if it was the caretaker. So just to be on the safe side, people don't generally work after four o'clock in the evening, say, so we didn't think they'd be up here. And it lasted for long, longer than ever, but sooner or later they got into what was going on and they came here and they must have waited around the corner watching from afar one morning when he came and he went up the roof to take the transmitter down and before he could open the hatch to come back down the police and the DTI were right. underneath the hatch waiting for him to come back down right. and it was kind of what are you doing up there I'm just admiring the view <laughs> one of them and they just told him to come down they went up there retrieved it and yeah that was it so the fine then Another studio location used on a temporary basis between the two sheds was in Newton Heath. This was the location of one of Buzz FM's biggest busts in 2004, which Eric was ultimately convicted of in 2007. Initially, the studio was located in a porter cabin outside in the yard, and then later inside a porter cabin that was in a warehouse. The Band 2 link carried the signal up to Hornchurch Court, the site of the main transmitter, and one evening, while the legendary Big Al Rockwell was on the air, the DTI decided to strike. Yeah, so this is where um, Buzz FM suffered its biggest bust, I would say. Um, so I came round this corner, there was no cars here at all, I came round here, I was about to do my show at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And as I got to about here, there was a police van. The side doors on the van opened, and I've never seen so many police jump out of a van. There must have been 10, maybe more. And they went one way, the other way, this way, that way. They scattered. Then I saw guys who I recognised them was DTI. So I managed to turn my car around in the street as quick as I could and come down the street. In the meantime, the police had seen me turning around in the street something must have been said and I saw the police guy go to jump in his car now by the time I've seen him got in his car I'm gone I have gone <laughs> up this street and I've gone round these back streets as far as I can just turn in left right left right left right as I don't really know the streets around here to be fair and luckily he didn't know where I'd gone I parked my street uh, my car a few streets away and myself and the girl who was with at the time walked back round here and we saw them basically just carrying all the studio equipment out. So where was the studio? The studio was in a warehouse which is on the right hand side in the moment if it's still here because it may have gone now. It may have gone. Looking at these units, these units were never here. But well, where this new warehouse stands now, this was an old brick warehouse and inside that brick warehouse there was a porter cabin. As you can see they still do the porter cabins and inside that porter cabin was our studio. I'm on the phone to the DJ who's in the studio, he's still unaware that they're outside and they're about to bust in. And I can't get through because the phone's engaged constantly because people from Buzz are ringing. Right. You know, to get a shout and get yeah. the tune played. And I eventually managed to get through. This wasn't the first or the last raid on Buzz FM. Join me in the next instalment where we'll be delving even deeper into Manchester's best loved pirate radio station and looking at more transmitter and studio locations as well as the many DTI raids that Buzz suffered over the years.